Father, we just thank you so much for allowing us to come together. We thank you so much, Holy Spirit, that you're here with us, that you're inside of us, leading and guiding us, and that you reveal truth to us and, and change us as we behold Jesus. And we ask you that you reveal Jesus to us tonight and that you help us to see new light into him and, and give us a deeper revelation to our righteous standing in him and God. And we just thank you so much for that. And the Holy Spirit, you just do what you need to do with me. You speak through me, and it's your show, your words, and what you need to reveal, you bring it out. And I pray that you per person who is listening to this, Father, and hearing the sermon and hearing the words that you have for them, I pray that it affects them so much that they, when they leave out or are done listening to the message, that they, they'll be thinking of them, not of themselves, but of Jesus, and helping them Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So tonight, we're going to talk about Righteousness and Healing Part 2. Just a couple weeks ago, I did this. We did Part 1. I did not know it was going to be a Part 2 into it, and we had the nice, beautiful tweet then, right? And so we got to study a little bit off of that. And we got to see in there how, how God wants us to be focused more on our righteous standing than us being healed, because in our righteousness, then the Holy Spirit is able to go work within us, quickening our body and healing all of our bodies, correct? So God wants to take it a little bit further. Because there's actually, the Bible's so rich in this, it's, it's actually crazy. Because I actually, we had, we had different sermons this morning, a you know, different title. And I had part two tonight, but God said, push that to the side. I want you to do a, a second part to this, because we're going to spend, actually, a lot of time in the Old Testament today, actually revealing Jesus and showing them, actually, actually showing us how, through the righteousness that we have in Christ, how the healing brings through. It'd be kind of amazing because I got several scenarios and several different things that goes along with that. But it's going to be a fun topic because I can tell you right now, this, this particular area is something that affected me this week. If you did not know, your pastor loves to play softball. I play softball on Tuesdays. And we have a doubleheader, and we were playing the first game, and we were winning the first game, but the rain decided to come in the middle of the game. Which is, mind me, I can care less if it rains or sun or what. I'm going to play the best that God's given me through his grace. It doesn't matter. Well, we win the game, and, you know, it took us about, we need about three runs in the, in the sixth inning. We play seven innings to make a small rule, so we need to be up by ten runs. So, I was the, I was the third hitter, so I was determined to get around and score the run, the, the go-hit run for the ten runs, and I was determined. So, need to say, your, your pastor did well. Got all the way around, was rounded third, coming home, decided to step onto the home plate, which was slick, and then my ankle went one way, my knee went another way, and I pulled my calf muscle. Pretty good, too. You know, and God, and it was funny because in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit was saying, hey, I want you to remind, remind you of the righteousness of God. Remember what you preached. Remember what I preached through you. And I was like, okay, I am playing the whole second game. On that, well, Hart Cab hit two home runs, not just over the fence home runs. They were in the park home runs, which means I had to run around the bases on that pull calf muscle. I ran as if it never hurt, which is funny. So then I got home, had a nice long chat with my wife, and got to bed late. And I had to get up early because I had to do some stuff that I was in ministry work. And my calf muscle hurt like I don't know what. I had a hard time walking on it. I was actually limping a lot, and it was you know it was painful. I couldn't stand on my toe, my, my toes and stuff on there, so it was really painful. And it was funny is that God, the Holy Spirit, was reminding me. I want to remind you that your righteousness is in Christ Jesus. I want you to focus on the only righteousness. So I was like, okay, I gotta preach what I say. I gotta do what I say, right? What has been coming out. So I ended up looking at that, looking at the righteousness, and it's funny what happened at that point. He then told me to go lay down, and I did. I got some sleep much needed nap that I needed at the time. And so I, I ended up resting just a little bit. And it's funny, when I woke up, my calf muscle wasn't even hurt anymore. It was as if I didn't even pull it. And I was able to do all kinds of stuff. I ended up lifting weights. I ended up doing like calf lifts as if I shouldn't be. And the next day, the following day, I ended up running seven miles, twice more, and doing all kinds of stuff as if it never bothered me. But I actually had pretty bad calf mold, which is funny because all the Holy Spirit was told me to do was to focus on my righteousness. And that's what I did. And it's funny how you went to work. Because one thing we revealed last time, part one, was Romans 8, verse 10 to 11. It says, but if Christ lives in you, then although your natural body is dead by reason of sin, you know, the Spirit is alive because of the righteousness that he imputes to you. And if the Spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised up Jesus from the dead will also restore you, restore to life your moral 
bodies through the Holy His Spirit who dwells in you. And this is funny. This is I get to testify to this. So it's actually kind of cool to actually be be able to preach it, but it also be a, a testimony of it as well. The Holy Spirit went to work in my body and repaired my calf muscle and made it better than it ever was. It actually made my leg much stronger than what it was before it got hurt. I find it to be quite interesting because God is just so good. Now what we're going to do, though, we're going to take a look at the Old Testament because there's so many different things there. Because we're going to look at people being poisoned to people dying because if you did not know somebody who's dead, needs healing. Let's be real. They need healing, too. Um, look at uh, women, a woman's wound that needs to be healed and her emotions need to be healed. It's funny how just not the healing, we always do physical healing, but it's also emotional healing too that God wants to bring to us. So we're going to look at the Old Testament. It's all found in the Old Testament. So we're going to actually take it back. It's going to be fun. If you're, not, if you're new to this, well, enjoy the ride because it may be the first time you've been actually preaching the Old Testament and not see your own self. It's going to be fun. We're just seeing a bunch of stories. We're actually going to see Jesus. So we're going to have fun with this. So we're going to go to Numbers 21. Now, before I get into this, I want you to know that before the law came in Mount Sinai, the people murmured and complained as much as they wanted to, and God never did anything to them, or he didn't allow anything bad to happen to them. He only showed them his grace. But since the law came, now when they the murmured and complained, God had to lift his protection because he was obligated by the law that they wanted, that the people of Israel wanted, so he had to allow whatever consequence of the action to come through. So this is one of the times that they decided to murmur and complain. You would think they got the point the first time they murmured and complained, but they didn't. But it's okay. So we're going to look at this in verse 4. And they, they journeyed from Mount Hor, interesting, by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Elam. And the people became impatient because of the trials of the way. Wow, how many of us get impatient? And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and we loathe this light manna. Wow, they complain against God's bread, his provision, and his, his, his supply of food every day. They said we have no bread, but yet God gave them bread every day. They call it light. They actually, actually disgrace what God had given them. It's kind of interesting. Then look what happens. <laughs> it says, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many Israels died. Now, the word sent there is not in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word actually means that he lifted his protection. He lifted his hand protection upon them and allowed the fire snakes to come upon them because they broke the law. Because they did, they did bad, they had, had bad stuff had to happen to them. Therefore, God was obligated to fly according to the law, which they want. So he lifted his protection, the fire snakes came in there. And it's funny. <laughs> they they complain, got bit, some of them die, but guess what they get, they get ready to do again? And the people came back to Moses, the same person they just complained to. How fun, they complained about Moses, which is quite interesting on its own. They complained about God and they complained about Moses, yet they're, now they're coming back to Moses and ask for help, which is kind of funny. And they said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the servants from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Now, they went back to him. Man, they actually admit that they were what? Weak. So it's okay to be weak. It's okay to go to the same person that you just wronged and tell them you're sorry. I think it's actually a good thing, a good step for us here. Because it's kind of cool. It's actually people, they actually say it. Now, what's funny is that Moses showed the people he had no power. Because he prayed to a God who had the power. Who has the power? God does. I love that. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery, fiery serpent of bronze, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it in a pole, it on a pole, and then a serpent had bitten any man, man, when he looked to the serpent of the bronze, Attentively, expectantly, with a steady and absorbing gaze, he lived. Now, I want to give you a picture of what that actually looks like. This is actually what it looks like. Now, if you did not notice one thing too, why did God ask for a bronze serpent? Now, when they, when they made this, they beat it as one continuous piece of bronze and they beat it into shape. I want you to kind of understand that. The, in the, in the garden, a, a snake came and did what? Trick Adam and Eve, right? The snake is a symbolism of sin on a wooden pole. 
This actually speaks of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, which is even more interesting, it's one piece, so it's beaten in this shape. Jesus was beaten for us on the cross. Now, also two, bronze always speaks of God's judgment. So, if you look at the symbolism of this, they looked at Jesus being judged and beaten for their sin on the cross. And that knows that they were dying from poison, because they were poisoned by the snakes, they were bitten by the snakes, and they were poisoned. And when they looked at this, they all lived. They looked and saw Jesus being judged for their sins, not necessarily taking the stripes for their healing, but being judged for their sins, they were instantly healed. How amazing is that? That looking at their righteousness, their right standing with God, they were instantly healed. That is powerful. I mean, that's absolutely amazing how God did that. Because we will say, well, you got to repeat that your body your stripes are healed. You got to keep repeating that. got to keep repeating that. You got to re keep repeating that. Instead, God brought this out. Now, notice that they said we had sin. So, which is interesting, they knew that sin causes sickness and disease and stuff to happen to our body. Hmm. Pretty, pretty smart little people that Israelites were then. They knew they had what? A sin issue. And to overcome the poison, they needed a sin remedy. How funny. And God gave them the sin remedy. And they actually, in that, they gave their, their standing. Because even Jesus, in the New Testament, in John 3, even talked about this. In, in John 3, 14, he goes, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent, in the desert on a pole, so much it necessary that the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross. So he's actually, Jesus actually told us what it was all about. It's funny, most of, most of the stuff that we see in the Old Testament is revealed in the letters that Paul read, but Jesus himself had it revealed to everybody for us. He says, that was me. I want you to know that was me. And he's talking to Nicodemus in this, and he's trying to get Nicodemus to believe in him by seeing him in what? In the scriptures. I love that. He, he was trying to show him himself in the scriptures so that he would believe on him through the scriptures. That makes me you and I pretty good same playing field, right? If he had if God, if Jesus wanted him to see the scriptures, then we need to see Jesus in the scriptures too. In order that everyone who believes in him, who cleaves to him and trusts in him, relies on him, may not perish but have eternal life and actually live forever. I find that to be absolutely beautiful and marvelous that God's remedy was putting a snake on a pole and actually showing them Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what brought them healing. I think that's absolutely amazing when that when they saw it. All who looked lived, and the people who didn't, they perished. They died. It kind of sounds to me quite interesting to what was happening in the Corinthian church, that when they took communion, they weren't seeing Jesus Christ. Therefore, Many people were passed away. Where, what did Paul say? He said, Many of you are now asleep because they weren't seeing Jesus in the communion. And when you see Jesus, you see your righteousness. And therefore, you're healed. A lot of them were sick with all kinds of stuff. But because they weren't seeing Jesus, they were dying. God's remedies always show you the Son. Jesus is the answer. Well, let's keep going. Let's go to another one because there's so many more. Now, we're going to talk about Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20. Hezekiah, this one I find to be the most interesting. It actually took some details because there was a part in here that actually really got my attention. Maybe they're like, hold on, God, there is a deep mystery here, a deep secret here that you have for us that you want to unveil for us. And I, was, and I went past it and I had to wait several days. Yes, I had to be patient on it. So, but then God brought it, which when he brought it, I thought, good thing I was sitting on the floor, because otherwise I would have been on the floor no matter what. But Hezekiah, at this time, Hezekiah and, and Judah, the two, the two empires, of the nation the nation had split between the north and the south with Judah and, and um, Benjamin. And Hezekiah, the same army that just took away the northern kingdom, was coming against the southern kingdom. And they had surrounded or sieged Hezekiah. Uh, Jerusalem. So Hezekiah, which is quite interesting, he was a great king, 
but he became sick. So it says, in those days, Hezekiah became daily ill. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, oh, whatever it said, came and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die, and you shall not recover. Wow, that's pretty bad news, isn't it? Sounds like some of the doctor reports we get today. Oh, you might as well go ahead and make your will. You're getting ready to die. This cancer got you. It's, it's okay. You go ahead. Go kiss your loved ones. You ain't going to be here tomorrow. Right? I mean, you think about this. Hezekiah's are like, oh, crap, man. I thought I was going to live for a long time. I'm, you tell me I'm going to die? Now, check what Hezekiah did. It says, then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, now, my question was, what was this wall? And I'll get back to that. But that was my question. Why did it say he turned his face to the wall? There has to be something about the wall. Has to be. God is just going to put stuff there for no reason. Everything has a reason. So, he goes, he says, I beseech you, O Lord, remember, earnestly remember now how I have walked before you in faithfulness and truth and with a whole heart and turned your devote to you and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had gone out of the middle of the court, middle court, notice where they are at. They're actually inside the temple. The word of the Lord came to him. Turn back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your forefather. I have heard your prayer and have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you on the third day. You shall go up to the house of the Lord. And I will add to your life fifteen years and deliver you to this city, Jerusalem, out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this, this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And Isaiah said, Bring a cake of figs and let them lay it on the burning information that he made recover. So he had 15 more years to his life, right? He, he got healed, and all of a sudden they defeated the army, which he didn't even defeat himself. It was actually God who defeated it, and it was kind of miraculously how that came about, too. But first off, Isaiah said, Bring cakes of figs. Hmm. Figs always speak of what? Man's righteousness. Because when Adam and Eve had sinned, they took fig leaves to cover themselves. Which is funny, because before they were driven out of the garden, God had to kill an animal and cover them himself. And Jesus, in, down the road, cursed a fig tree because it couldn't produce any fruit. Fig tree always speaks of man's effort. Man can't do it. On your own effort, you can't produce fruit. So therefore, Jesus cursed your own effort. You'll never bring in fruit. You'll always you'll wither away. Your own effort will wither away. But notice that he told Hezekiah to bring cakes of figs. Cake of figs. Come and lay down your own effort and burn up. It was to be a burnt offering. It was to be burnt up, disappeared. Now, one of the biggest things I, I looked at, too, was this wall. And when I figured this whole thing out, and it seemed that Isaiah was walking in the court, and in the Hebrew it was the court and the, the temple of God. So, the wall in which he prayed to was made of what? Gold. And this is huge, because gold speaks of God's righteousness. He look towards God's righteousness, which we have. Remember, in Christ we get Jesus' righteousness, not our own righteousness, but Jesus' righteousness, to be in right standing with God. He looked to the wall, the goal, to God's righteousness, and prayed to God's righteousness, and not his own. He had laid down his own efforts and picked up God's efforts. And when he picked up God's efforts, he was healed. It was his righteousness, God's own righteousness, which healed Hezekiah. Which is really cool to see that here. And to actually know that that little, little gem there kind of just brings out why he was even healed. It's because it was righteousness. Not his own effort. Not that he prayed the good prayer. It's the fact that he looked to God's righteousness. He was able to even pray a good prayer, period. And then therefore he was healed. Right? I love that. I love how God always brings it out. It's interesting that this righteousness that we have in God, in Christ, it breeds out this healing so attractive to us. 
it comes to us as if we're a magnet and we realize that we are righteous, how it just comes trapped in a place that they're just at the right time. The right moment, so when we stepped in there, it'd be glued to us, right? Got another one though. Now, we're gonna look at somebody dying. And I know we always say that, hey, we don't see if people get raised from the dead today. Well, maybe because we don't know our righteousness. Same. I think the church has been off. The church has been way off. We've been focused on our own righteousness and what we do for God instead of what Jesus has done for us and relying on his righteousness that we have that breeds out fruits. Imagine the church sitting here standing on his righteousness and not our own and going about doing works in his righteousness. Maybe we'll see more people raised from the dead. And if you look in history, the people who raised people from the dead, they were in tune with their righteous standing they had in God. Look it up. It's in history. So we go to 1 Kings, verse 17, chapter 17. Now, this is about a woman who had who, who was barren. She was barren, had a husband. They, were, they always wanted a kid, and they made a house for Elijah. Elijah, they saw him come passing by, and they say, hey, man, we got to make a bid for this man of God so he can you know, stay and we'll cook him food. He can stay as long as he wants to, but every time he's passing through, he has a place to stay. Nice, very nice. Hey, they do something about taking care of their leaders. It's, it's really good revelation that they got because as a church, we should always take care of our leaders. Amen? Right? So they built this, they built this house. They built an um, apartment onto the house for him. And so they built it. He and Elijah saw it. He prayed for them to what? Open the, her womb and that they may have a child. So she didn't have a child. Okay? Now, we're going to pick up the story that the child becomes sick. And who does she run to? We'll see. Check it out. After these things, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? Have you come to, to me and called my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Wow. Now, it's interesting about the story is that <laughs> prophets back then were known to what? Bring back the remembrance of their sins. Prophets in these days always point people to their sins. Today, under grace, they point us to our righteousness. Because God doesn't remember our sins anyway. So if anybody is trying to be a prophet, trying to remember, call your members to your sin, God says, and they're saying to be led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has said in Hebrews 8 and, 8 and chapter 10 that God doesn't remember your sin anymore. So hang on that one for a little while. But have you called my members to sin? My sin. So she's like, I, I, I must have sinned here or something, and my son's dead or dying. Dying, right? He had to die, right? There's no breath left in him. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her bosom and carried him up to the chamber where he stayed and laid him on his own bed. So he took him up, placed him on the bed. I love this. Now notice that he placed him on the bed. Make sure. He placed him on the bed, which is a picture of what? Rest. It's a picture of rest. You lay on the bed, don't you feel restful? Yeah, you're not working. You're laying down. You're resting. Notice he laid him on the bed. And Elijah cried to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought the further claim upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and he cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, I pray you, let this child's soul come back to him. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came into him again and he revived. Now, the hidden mystery here is here in verse 21. It says he stretched himself upon the child. And the Hebrew says he stretched his arms out and laid on top of him, what? Three times. It's actually a picture of us. Jesus stretched his arms out and laid on top of him three times. So he, Jesus laid in the grave three days. Three times. And on the third day, the, soul, on the third time, the, the child came to life. It's a picture of Jesus on the cross, is it not? He stretched out his arms. Notice the boy was at rest. At rest, looking at Jesus' finished works, he came back to life. He was healed. Completely healed. Functioned everything. He revived. How amazing that we missed that. We say, oh, look at the Elijah. Look at Elijah. No, it's actually, a, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus there. <laughs> Jesus was there. His righteousness 
on the cross, he became sin on the cross, so you and I would be what? Made righteous. Made righteous. And this righteousness healed this boy. Brought him from the dead. Had no breath in his lungs to bring breath back in him. His soul means his spirit came back in. The very life came back in. And he was alive. It's a picture you go for more. It's a picture of us. Because through our resting on the cross, we have life. We revived from the dead. We were dead without him. Which is amazing. Now, it's funny that this happened to Elijah. Elijah had the same thing happen to him. So check this out. So we go, oh, let's keep going. All right, so we go to 2 Kings now. Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind to fire, chariot fire up to heaven. Now, Elijah takes his place with what? Double portion of grace. He said, I want a double portion of his anointing, God. And the mantle, when Elijah went up, the mantle came down. That mantle is the what? Talit in Hebrew. His talit came down, and he took his talit and put it on him with the double portion. Woo. That speaks right there on itself. It speaks on its own. So, he has, Elijah had this double anointing on him. Now, we pick up the story here. A woman had a child again. Another woman has a child. Man, man, this is brutal days back then for women and their children. See it, watch. When the child had grown, he went out one day to his father with the reapers. But his, he said to his father, my head, my head. So something hit his head. He either fell or somebody wasn't paying attention and clumped him in the head or somebody did it on purpose. Who knows? He got hit in his head. The man said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And he was brought to his mother. He sat on his knees until noon and then he died. So something, the boy, the boy died. Now turn to the woman. Then she said, did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Then he said to Gaziah, so she went to where? She went to go see Elijah. She said, Elijah, you got to do something about this. Because he actually prayed for her to have a son, and he had a son. Yeah, a son like Elijah, you know what? Now, he said to, to her, the woman's name is Gehazi, gird up your loins and take my staff in your hand, and go lay, go lay my staff on the face of the child. If you meet any man, do not salute him. If he salutes you, do not answer him. The mother of the child said, As the Lord lives and as my soul lives, I will not leave you. And then he rose and followed her. Now, Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff on the child's face. But the boy near spoke nor heard. Wow. So Elijah said, Go take the staff, wooden staff, and go place it on his face. And she did. And nothing happened, though. The child has not awakened. Okay. So he went back to meet Elijah and said to him, the child has not awakened. Hmm. When Elijah arrived in the house, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. Laying on his bed. Man, it sounds just like what Elijah, what happened to Elijah, did not it? The boy was at rest. So he went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Oh. Somehow he missed the last part. But if you read on, it says that he laid upon him with stretched out arms, from eye to eye, face to face, hand to hand. He took the boy, stretched out his arms, and laid on top of him face to face, and the boy lived. Again, we see Elijah, Elijah in the Hebrew, stretching out his arms and laying on him. He, Jesus, took our place. And again, the boy lived. He lived. It's funny how that happens, that through that righteousness again, somebody who need, who need healing, he was dead, he needed healing, came to life through that righteousness that's on the cross. Now check this somebody who else is dead. Now check this out. Elijah had died. Elijah was dead and he was buried. He was put in the cave. Okay? They, his bones in there. Now check this out. Elijah died and they bury him. Now it's funny because at this point here, Judah is getting attacked by, I think, um, some country. It's another, another civilization. They're being attacked, right? 
Now, this part is taken out. This part right here, which is weird, because it talks about how they invaded this land of Jerusalem, of Judah, and it's coming after Jerusalem, and how they're coming to him, how this one person, and all of a sudden it stops and says, oh, Elijah died and they buried him. And bands of the Moabites, the Moabites, who were double cursed by God, invaded the land in the spring of the next year. So Elijah died. They came in. As a man was being buried on an open bier, and such a band was seen coming, the man was cast to Elijah's grave. And when the man, when the man being let down touched the bones of Elijah's, he revived and stood on his feet. Wow. They threw him into Elijah's tomb. As soon as he touched his bones, his bones, the man came to life. And I said, God, this, this is just in the midst of this context. Why did you put this in here? This makes no sense. This makes absolutely no sense, right? How do you touch somebody's bones and live? You did not know that Elijah... Elijah. Out of everybody in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, he did more miracles than anybody else combined. He did. If you go through, he did. He raised more people from the dead. He actually healed somebody of leprosy. He did all these amazing miracles. And I'm not talking about miracles of these of what Elijah did. Elijah brought a lot of judgment upon the earth. Judgment upon the people. Elijah's didn't, which is funny because he's actually a picture of who? Jesus. Elijah is actually a picture of Jesus Christ. It's funny when he touched his bones, Jesus' death, the man came to life. And in that, what do you see? You see, Jesus died for your sins. And because he touched his death, he became alive. Again, we see again the righteousness that Jesus taking our sins, putting us in right standing, how it heals us. It's funny, he just touched his bones, his death. He was put to death so that we would be put to life. Now it all happened on the cross. It's all happened on the cross. Elijah is a picture of Jesus Christ in the grave. I love it. I just love these little hidden gems that God has for us. I think it's so powerful and it's so amazing there. It's, it's, God wants us to see his righteousness. And it's so funny because in this, you look at all these healings, they all based on what? Jesus Christ. What he's doing, what he did for us on the cross. It's all hidden there. It's all about Jesus on the cross. Everyone whose healings are about Jesus on the cross. Not saying, oh, you're healed by his stripes. No, it's not. It's not that. It's actually what he did on the cross. Becoming your sin, becoming you, dying your place, and then you're made healed. And it sounds so contradictory, and, the, and it's so weird to us in, in, in the church because we've been focused on that one part. Oh, by his stripes we're healed. That's cool and all, but if you read the verses before, it says, "Because he became sin." He got punished for our sins. He got punished for our sins, and therefore, we're healed. And you see the same man in the Old Testament. Now, I have a woman here, and the next one is my last one. Now, she's, this is really cool. The woman didn't have a child. She wanted a child so bad. She wanted a child so bad that it hurt her. That every time she would come up not pregnant. And she had a very deep emotional hurt. Besides her wanting a child, she was hurt emotionally. Now, which is interesting about this, is that this woman comes from somebody very important. We'll, we'll find out about that. So let's go to 1 Samuel 1. So Hannah rose early after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his seat beside a post of the temple of the Lord. And Hannah was in distress of soul, praying to the Lord and weeping bitterly. She vowed, saying, O Lord of hosts, if you would indeed look on, my, on the affliction of your handmaid, and earnestly remember and not forget your handmaid, but will give me a son, and I will give him to the Lord all his life, no razor shall touch his head. Right? No razor shall touch his head. She is pleading. She's like, please, Lord, 
I want a child so bad. And she weak, literally. Means what? All these times she thought she was pregnant, she came out not pregnant. And the loss of that expectation hurt her so bad. Her not having a son hurt her emotionally. Now, you don't watch someone who's healed emotionally and also have her wound be healed too. So women, if you're looking for a child, if you want a child, look to what she what she did and look to what she had looked forward to. So she saw the prayer. And she and as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli knows her mouth. And Hannah was speaking in her heart. I love that. <laughs> this is so deep. She was speaking from her heart. If you ever want to be emotionally healed of being hurt, of no matter what it is, you need to what? Speak from your heart. He wants you to speak out what you feel. And she really did speak out how she felt. She was hurting. Not every time she thought she was pregnant and it came up. She thought her, she missed her period. She knew, she must have knew, right? She was getting ready. You know, they didn't have pregnancy tests back then, but picture it. A woman now, thinking every time with her husband, she's like, man, I'm a week late in my period. Let me go take the test. And she goes to take the test, and she's hoping, hoping that one minute's up, and it still has just one line across. Not pregnant. And she keeps doing this month after month after month. She's hurt so bad by it. That expectation of having a child, you know, I imagine everyone's expectation is to have a child, to birth a child out. It doesn't matter who you are, every woman has that desire to birth a child out. She is no different. Hannah is no different. But she is telling God how much it hurts her. Not having a, not having a, not just having a child, but having a son. She was very specific about it. She really wanted a son. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Her heart was talking. A lot of Eli can see that. But her lips were moving, but her voice wasn't coming out. Oh, man, that's powerful. That is a powerful prayer. That is a power in tune connection to God. That's what you call it, intimacy on the next level. But Eli, looking from the outside, thought she was drunk. Wow. How many times do we think that somebody who's speaking from the heart is just absolutely crazy? Eli thought she was crazy. Thought she must have been drunk. She must have been drinking too much wine. She must be actually drunk. And we look at somebody who's talking their feelings as if they're crazy. Why do you feel that way? You shouldn't be feeling that way. Blah, blah, blah. Ah, you're just a crazy person for feeling like that. But everybody has feelings who are unique to them. It could be one same situation. You have two siblings and it affects them totally different. How it is. So Eli said to her, How long will how long will you be intoxicated? Put what put wine away from you. Wow. This woman is hurt because she hasn't had a son. She's speaking from her heart to God. Wow, how many times have you been criticized for talk, putting out your heart to God? Oh, you shouldn't do that. Put it away. Put it away. Put it away this intoxication. Wow. How rude I would say. How very rude that was. She was talking to God. She was at intimacy with God. But Hannah answered, I love this, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. So now she's still speaking her heart. I had drunk near wine nor strong drink, but I was pouring out my soul before the Lord. She was pouring out her heart. I can tell you right now, if you're hurt, pour out your heart, not your head, but your heart out to God. And when you get out, God can come in and heal. It's casting, that was, that's what it means to what? Cast your care on the God. Because when you cast it out, God is able to bring healing. If you're hanging on to any of it, God can't bring healing. He can't manifest the healing because you're still hanging on part of it. You're in pride thinking that you can do it. By hanging on to it, any teeny little bit, a little crumb, hang on to it, thinks that you can do what? You can get through it yourself. By letting it all out to him, you say, I'm weak, God. Your grace is sufficient. God goes, I got you, my child. I'm coming in to heal. I'm going to heal you. 
I'm a, I'm a so I'm going to be better than what it was. Right? I love that. She poured out her heart. Man, so be weak. I want you to know that. I want you, she took a position of weakness. Self-righteousness is taking a position of pride. But leaning on Jesus' righteousness is a position of saying you're weak. I'm okay. Like Paul. Paul says, I didn't boast in my pride. I, I, I rather admit that I'm weak. So the God, his grace can just take over my life. Because I know his grace is the only thing that can bring it through. My whole strength has not been getting it done. I couldn't do this. For the years I was, I was a Pharisee, a Pharisee, I tried to make it happen. I tried my best, and I couldn't make it happen. Couldn't do it. So I, I, I said, God, I'm weak. And God took over. And he saw more accomplished in his life than all apostles combined. Saw that. So notice this woman. She took the position of humility. She was actually being humble. How? Wow. Wow. We think somebody pouring out the heart. It's being very prideful. Actually, it's a position of humble. She's casting that care out. Here, God, you love me. Well, here it is now. It's beautiful. So she's hurt emotionally. Besides her wound being closed up, she's hurt in her heart. Feelings and emotions hurt. Regard not your handling as a wicked woman. For out of my mouth, out of my great complaint and fair provocation, I've been speaking. Then Eli, Eli said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you petition which you have asked of him. I love this. He so, said, yeah, 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 whatever. Just, I don't want you in here. <laughs> He's basically just kind of like say, you, you still sound like a crazy woman. Just get out. Okay? Now, I, I love Hannah's response. Hannah said, let your handmaid find grace in your sight. So she went her way and ate, and her countenance no longer sat. Who does that sound like? That sounds like Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, does it not? God, your grace is sufficient. He went from being what? Beat down by the devil and, and just plead, beg God please, to boasting that he's weak and just being overjoyed, filled with joy. This woman went from sad sorrow and she went to pour out her heart. I'm weak, God. Let me find your grace. Let me find your grace in your sight. Let me find your grace. To being sad and sorrowful, to being no longer sad. The opposite of sad is what? Happy. So she was, she was being like for us. So happy, right? She was. It totally changed her. She looked at what? God, grace brings in what? God's righteousness on. Grace puts us in what? Right standing with God. She took the humble position of what? Receiving God's grace. Because if we're in pride, we're not receiving his grace. Or we say, God, you can keep your grace. I got my own shape. I got it done. But when we happily receive it, we what? We lean on our righteous standing that we have with God. She leaned on it. Now check what happens. Not just because, now look at her. She's no longer hurt. She got healed emotionally. Wow. Now, we would think, this just out of curiosity, we think we know what's best for people, right? Let's be real. We always think we know what's best. Now, we would say, well, to heal her, let's give her a child, God. God, give her a child. Right? Let's give her a child. That would be the, that would, I will fix everything. God goes, she needs emotional healing first. God knows better than we do. Like I said before, a couple weeks ago when I was talking about this, you know, when we first had our second child, man, I'm, I'm sorry, getting no sleep at night, I became very irritable. I, I, it was quick, man. I'm talking about the fuse was short. I don't care who you were. It could be an angel fire. I'm going to get mad at you because my fuse was short. I asked God, and I knew that I had no condemnation. I looked, linked on that right, and I said, God, I need your help. I don't want to be like this anymore. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I need your help. 
help me. And guy goes, I'm gonna get you more sleep. And I'm like, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, oh. ho, ho. You know, you think you're like, ho, oh, oh. ho, yeah, right. How is sleep gonna fix this situation? You need this. You need to get your mind right. You need to start acting right. And that's what we'll tell people. You gotta, you gotta stop, you gotta stop getting so mad. God goes, he just needs more sleep. And when I got more sleep, I became less irritable. Heard about a man who had a smoking issue. He smoked cigarettes and he couldn't stop for 20 plus years and, and never could figure it out. And until one day he says, God, I need your help. I know I'm righteous in Christ. Help me to stop smoking cigarettes. And we, us as a church, you know, it seems like us, us religious people would be like, you just need to stop smoking. Get the patch or something, you know, and start beating yourself up every time you try to take a smoke, right? But God, knowing the issue caused, knew that he need, that he actually had stress at this job and took away the job and gave him a better job, which took away the stress, which took away the sickness. God always knows the root cause. He knew that she needed healing in her heart. We would think that, oh, give her a baby, she'll be healed. Actually, God knew if she got the baby, she would still have the hurt. And it would be good for that child. I actually heard somebody's testimony talk about that. That they, they had hurt before they gave birth, and they actually put on the child. And the child was born. She actually needed to be healed. And that was, it changed her whole view of her child. She started changing the child nicely. So no, emotionally healed, seeing what? God's righteousness. Our right standing with God, right? Now check what else happens. The family rose early the next morning, worshiped before the Lord, and returned to their home of Ram Ramaha. I think I said it right. I don't know. Somebody do it. Hannah, his wife, and oh, her husband slept with her wife. His wife, her wife. Her and her husband got it on. And the Lord, the Lord remember her. Hannah became pregnant. And in due time, she bore a son. And he, he named him Samuel. We all know him as the prophet Samuel. His name means heard of God. This is funny. In James, he says, the prayer of the righteous avail all time, which means they're always heard and they always come to pass. She took the position of righteousness in, in Christ and grace. And God always hears her. God hurt her. She didn't come at him religiously. She took a position. Even though we think, oh, pour out your heart, it's not very righteous. God says, I hurt her, though. I healed her. And I gave her a son. Oh, I didn't just give her an old son. I gave him, gave her the prophet Samuel, who will what? Anoint the first king, but yeah, yet anoint a better king, which is a picture of Jesus Christ. We all know that as David. King David. He didn't just give her a son. He gave her a, a really cool son. It's restoration. Restoration for her hurt. Notice that it was restoration. But this righteousness, her womb was closed up, and leaning on that righteousness opened her womb, and she was able now to see a child. Her womb was what? Healed. She was then she was also healed emotionally. Because she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Now, to take it even deeper, her name is actually pretty, it's really cool. And Hannah, Hannah, in Hebrew, the name means grace. It's also where we get Anna. Anna means grace too. But we also know the number of Jesus, when Jesus was first born, they took him to the temple. The prophetess Hannah rejoiced seeing her. Grace rejoiced seeing Jesus come. Her name was Grace. Let me find grace in your sight, Lord. She walked in grace. That's all right standing on God. It's funny how they brought that out. Now, we always think that for some reason through the cross, it's always, it's yeah, that's cool, that's our, just our sins. We always just dismiss that, that, that. That's cool. I mean, that's just our sins. I mean, what is that else to it? But that one sin in the garden, it was a root that grew a tree, grew all these branches, all these sickness, diseases, and these all other sins, which all branched out from that one sin. So Jesus came, but was condemned in the flesh, sin, sin, plural, or singular, and, and you see this in Romans 8. It says he was condemned in the flesh, 
sin that root. He condemned that one sin in the flesh on his body, which then killed the whole tree. And that tree is your sickness and disease, poverty. Condemning that one sin put you in right standing with God. And that tree, which had all this evil stuff, was killed by the root. And he grew a new root in you, a righteous root. Now, guess what springs from that? Your righteous, your healing, your prosperity, your peace, your everything. Salvation. It's a tree called the tree of salvation. Not a tree of sin. It's funny how God knew the root cause of it all. It was the cross. The cross in the end. And we're going to end with this one, Romans 8. It says, He who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him freely and graciously give us all other things? By giving him up for us, he made us in right standing. He took our place and we took Jesus' place. With that, God freely imputes everything else to us freely. Because he doesn't hold it higher than his son. His son is the highest. And he imputes it all to us. Freely. Not, not us earning it, but freely. Graciously. Charisma. I think it's charis, charis in the Greek. It's gracious. So that's why it says freely and graciously. Amplified is trying to bring the, the word grace out. That's why grace. So with our right standing in God and this new tree of salvation, that root produces all these other things into our lives. And the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you to see your healing. He's obligated. We saw that in the very first thing. It says, as you wake yourself to righteousness, the Holy Spirit goes to work in your body. He's obligated to bring out the healing that he's already put inside you. He's to draw it out and put it to your body, quicken your body. Just as we saw each one of those, when the, when, <laughs> when the people were bit by the snakes, they looked to the cross. That's what they did. They looked to the cross, for crying out loud, and they were healed instantly. Hezekiah, he prayed to God's righteousness, and he laid down to his own righteousness, and he was healed. We saw the two boys who both died, and the prophets, the, Jesus laid, died on the cross, laid on them. And while they were at rest, and resting in Jesus' right, finished works, they were resting in Jesus' finished works. And they brought the life. They had the healing they need for their body. Brought them back to life. Then we see the man who was dead touch Jesus' death and became alive. His, all righteousness through his death. We got righteousness through his death. He came alive. And then we saw this woman. Her emotionally did not have a child, looked to God's grace, and was healed emotionally and physically and produced a child. Looking at that righteousness and keeping your eye focused on that righteousness, man, God only tells us to put faith in one thing. That's our right standing with Him. And we take it as we got to put faith in all these things. No, God, you know what? This You can take it even deeper beyond, beyond your healing. You can say, you know what? This is not going to happen to me because I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Prosperity is my future and my present and my future because I'm the righteousness in, in Christ Jesus. This is who I am. And that's where God wants you to place your faith in, in that righteousness. Because everything else, everything you need in your life, it's right there. It's available to you because you're in right standing with Him. That's it. That's it. Isn't that simple? We think we have to put faith in all these different things and we... We have come up short in all these things, do we not? We do, man. Cause we like man, I don't believe my healing anymore. I'm gonna oh, I'm gonna perish now. Or man, I, I, my faith is no longer in my prosperity. God, no, God's like oh, children, children, children. I want you to believe that you're righteous in Christ. Just, just believe that. You're, you're doing all these things. Just do one thing. Just believe that you're right standing with God. You're right standing with me through Christ. That's it. Just keep believing that. Just keep believing that. Just keep believing that. I just wait to his righteousness. Just wait to his righteousness. Keep seeing Jesus dying for you on the cross, taking your place. You're right standing with me. Not based on your works, but based on what he has done. Stay focused. Stay focused on that. Just, just one thing. Just one thing. Just one thing, child. It's okay. Just, just relax. Just rest. Just rest. That's it. 
righteousness, just righteousness, just righteousness. Guess what? All these things are going to come to you. It's all going to come to you. Because guess what? When you're when you're righteous minded, man, your power, you're in that resurrection power we talked about before. You reign in life. You walk above everything. Everything's just coming to you. Because as he is, so are we in this world. If he's healed, so are we. And it's not based on anything we did right that we say, oh, by his stripes we're healed. No, it's based on the fact that we're righteous with him. He's our representation. He's our high priest. And as he is, so is the people. That's us. It's right standing with God. Period. One thing. One thing. Gave up his own son. Everything else is freely ours. Focus on that one thing. He didn't have to go and, and live by each thing. God doesn't have to. Because he just wants you to focus on the one thing. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, healing's there. Yes, you have healing. Yes, you're healed. Yes, I'm, yeah, 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 you're rich. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. You have peace. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, you have this. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But I want you to focus. I gave my son up for you. I want you to know you're right standing with me, child. That's it. Yeah, I. Yeah, I'll give you insight. Yes, this is, this is going to come to you. Yeah, so in this situation, you see sickness and disease attacking you by, I want you to focus on your righteousness. Just focus on your righteousness. You know what I mean, focus you. Yep, 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 yep. Pro- attack on your, pro- on your, on your finances. Yep, I, I know. But look to me. Look at your right standing. Look at your right standing. Yes, yes, yep. Oh, it goes away. Oh, getting attacked by the family. Something happened to your family. Oh, oh. Just look at your righteousness. Just look at your righteousness. Yep, you're righteous in Christ. Look at Jesus on the cross. Look at Jesus. Yep, it goes away. There's no weapon formed against you shall prosper because you have been given God's righteousness. Therefore, it's attacking against God, and God has to do what? He has to step in for it. He says, the battle is mine, child. Sit back. Revenge is mine. I got you. Because it's really attack on me. Good, like a good father, he takes care of us. He always does. And you can see that in the scriptures. That our righteousness brings help in every area of our lives. doesn't matter if we're dead, emotionally hurt, or physically hurt. It brings it. Always.